So I want to start out this week with a recap of a couple of plot points from chapter 9. I know that last week you read chapter 9, but I didn't do a video explaining some of the more intricate details. So we're going to be looking at the plot in one film segment, and then in the other video we're going to look at some of the characters. So we'll analyze Wilson, Wolfsheim, the Owl-Eyed Man, Nick, as he's kind of growing and developing through this process, and then Gatsby slash his father. So <clears throat> the first plot element to note is just the setting and the time in which this takes place. So Nick begins by, like, all of this is a reflection, and he begins by saying this is two years ago. After two years, Nick says, I remember the rest of that day and that night and the next day, as an endless drill of police and photographers and newspaper men in and out of Gatsby's front door. Most of the reports were a nightmare, grotesque and circumstantial, eager and untrue, um, that were coming out in the newspapers. When McKellis' testimony at the inquest brought to light Wilson's suspicions of his wife, I thought the whole tale would shortly be served up in a racy pasquinade. But Catherine, who might have said anything, didn't say a word. So. Basically, um, the press is trying to figure out who is Wilson, who, why did he kill Gatsby, and rather than the truth coming out, um, Wilson and Myrtle had a neighbor, if you remember, he was just referred to as the Greek. Um, he was a witness of the yellow car that killed Myrtle, and he was one of the only witnesses in the crime. And so his testimony stands that Gatsby is the one that killed Myrtle. Um, nothing else comes, and, and then they tie Gatsby to the affair that Wilson was having. And so the press gets the story all wrong, and nobody is clearing the air. No one is helping to understand. So there have been three deaths, and all of those individuals who died have been victims. Myrtle was a victim, her husband, Wilson, was a victim, and Gatsby was a victim. And yet, Gatsby is pegged with the criminal activity of all of them. And so that's one thing that's really bothering Nick. Remember, he talked about being somebody who is unjudgmental and he seeks out the truth. And he's really bothered by this fact that why is it that Tom, who is a perpetrator, Daisy, who's the perpetrator, like she's the one who killed Myrtle, and um, the like are getting off Scott, like without any type of consequence. Um, so that really bothers him. <clears throat> so Catherine, remember this was Myrtle's sister, she showed up a surprising amount of character about it. She looked at the coroner with determined eyes under the corrected brow of hers and she swore that her sister had never seen Gatsby. Her sister was completely happy with her husband. Her sister had been into no mischief whatsoever and she convinced herself of it and cried into her handkerchief as if it were the very suggestion. So Wilson was reduced to a man who was deranged by grief in order that the case might remain in its simplest form and arrested there. But all of this part seemed remote and unessential. So for Nick to say that the murder and the death and the scandal and the rumors is unessential, he's about to tell us what is important about what's going on. I found myself on Gatsby's side and alone. And here's the essential part. Gatsby is truly, in this case, innocent of almost everything. He has not acted falsely, per se, um, one could argue, and yet he's the one being pegged for all of the wrongdoing. And <clears throat> he's alone in supporting Gatsby. From the moment I telephoned news of the catastrophe to West Egg Village, every surmise about him, every practical question was referred to me. At first I was surprised and confused, and then as he lay in his house and he didn't move or breathe or speak hour upon hour, I realized that I was responsible because nobody else was interested. Interested, I mean, with that intense personal interest to which everyone has some vague right at the end. So his point was, Nick is the one that called the police. Nick is the one that called for the newspapers. Nick is the one who said something's wrong. And nobody else took an interest in Gatsby. He had no connections no friends. He was just dead. But, and we're going to see a scene later where he's just kind of like laying in his living room or in his big mansion, a dead body and nobody there. Um, I called up Daisy half an hour after we found him. I called her instinctively and without hesitation, but she and Tom had gone away. They had taken baggage with them. They left no address. No, 
When will they be back? No. Any idea where they are? I don't know. Can't say. I wanted to get somebody for him. I wanted to go into the room where he lay and reassure him. I'll get somebody for you. Gatsby, don't worry. Just trust me and I'll get somebody for you. Nobody was there. Daisy had left. Meyer Wolfsheim's name wasn't in the phone book, clearly. The butler gave me his office address and I called. But by the time I answered, the lo it was long after five and no one answered again. I've rung them three times. It's very important. I went back to the drawing room and I thought for an instant that maybe there were some visitors, all these official people who suddenly filled the mansion. But as they drew back the sheet and they looked at Gatsby with unmoved eyes, his protest continued in my brain. Look here, old sport, you've got to get somebody for me. You've got to try hard. I can't go through this alone. Someone started to ask me questions, but I broke away and going upstairs looked through the unlocked parts of his desk. He never told me definitely that his parents were dead. But there was nothing, only the picture of Dan Cody, a token of forgotten violence staring down from the wall. The next morning, I sent the butler to New York with a letter for Wolfsheim, which asked for information, and I urged him to come out on the next train. The request seemed superfluous when I wrote it, and I'm sure he'd start when he saw the newspapers, and I was sure there'd be a wire from Daisy before noon. But nothing arrived. No one arrived. Just more police and photographers and newspaper men. And when the butler bought, brought back the answer, I began to have a feeling of defiance and scornful solidarity between Gatsby and me, against them all. And here's how Wolfsheim, Wolfsheim responded. Dear Mr. Carraway, this has been one of the most terrible shocks of my life. To me, I can hardly believe it, that it is true at all. Such a mad act as that man did should make all of us think. I cannot come down now as I'm tied up in some very important business and I can't get mixed up in this thing now. If there's anything I can do, a little later let me know in a letter by Edgar. I hardly know where I am when I hear about a thing like this and I'm completely knocked down and out. Yours truly, Meyer Wolfsheim. And then hastily added, let me know about the funeral. Do not know his family at all. So he basically says, I'm busy. I have something to do. So here's Gatsby. People flock. I mean, we're meant to see the contrast here. It's, it's almost hyperbole, which is extreme exaggeration. The fact that his parties were so well attended. And yet there isn't a single person who's willing to come out for Gatsby. When the phone rang that afternoon, um... I thought it would be Daisy, but the connection came through and it was a man's voice. This is Slagle speaking. Yes, the name was unfamiliar. Heck of a note, isn't it? Get my wire. There have been any, haven't there been any wires? Young Park's in trouble. They picked him up and he handed the bonds over the counter. They got a circular from New York giving him the numbers you five minutes before. What do you know about that? You never call, you never can tell in these hick towns. Hello? I interrupted. Look here, this isn't Mr. Gatsby. Mr. Gatsby's dead. There was a silence on the other end of the wire, followed by an exclamation, then a squawk, and the connection was broken. It was on the third day that a telegram signed Henry C. Gatz arrived from town in Minnesota. It said only that the sender was leaving immediately and to postpone the funeral until he came. It was Gatsby's father, an old man, very helpless and dismayed, bundled up in a cheap ulster against the warm September day. His eyes leaked continuously from excitement, and when I took the bag and umbrella from his hands, he began to pull incessantly at his gray beard. I had difficulty getting off his coat. He was on the point of collapse, so I took him to the music room, and I made him sit down a while. I saw it in the Chicago newspaper. It was all in the Chicago newspaper. I started right away. I didn't know how to reach you. His eyes seeing nothing moved about the room. It was a madman? He must have been mad. Would you like some coffee? I don't want anything. I'm all right now. Mr. Carrow, I'm all right. Where have they got Jimmy? I looked at him in the drawing room where his son lay, and I left him there. Some little boys had come up the steps, and I told them who'd arrived, and they went away reluctantly. After a while, Mr. Gatz opened the door, and he came out. His face was flushed. He'd reached an age where death no longer has the quality of ghastly surprise. <clears throat> he took in the height and the splendor of the hall and the room, and he had mixed awe and pride. I didn't know what you'd want, Mr. Gatsby. Gats is my name. Mr. Gats. I thought you might want to take the body west. Jimmy always liked it better down east. He rose up to his position in the east. Were you a friend of my boys? We were close friends. He had a big future, you know. He was only a young man, but he had a lot of brain power. If he'd lived, he'd have been a great man. A man like James J. Hill. He'd have helped the build up the country. Uh, that's true, I said uncomfortably. 
He fumbled at the embroidered coverlet. That night, an obviously frightened person called up and demanded to know who I was before he would give his name. This is Mr. Carraway, I said. Oh, this is Clip Springer. I was relieved too, because it seemed to promise another friend at Gatsby's grave. I'd been calling up a few people myself, and they were hard to find. The funeral's tomorrow, I said, three o'clock, here at the house. I wish you'd tell anybody who'd be interested. Oh, I will, he broke out hastily. Of course, I'm not likely to see anybody, but if I do... Uh, of course you'll be there yourself. Well, I'll certainly try. What I called about is... Wait a minute. How about saying you'll come? Well, the fact is... Mm, I'm staying with some people here in Greenwich, and they'd rather expect me to be with them tomorrow. And if there's a sort of picnic or something... Well, I'll do my best to get away. Huh? Well, what I called up about was a pair of shoes I left there. I wonder if it'd be too much trouble to have the butler send them. You see, they're tennis shoes, and I'm sort of helpless without them. I didn't hear the rest, because I hung up the receiver. After that, I felt a certain shame for Gatsby. One gentleman to whom I telephoned implied that he had got what he deserved. However, that was my fault. He was one of those who used to sneer at Gatsby on the courage of Gatsby's liquor. So, Wolfsheim won't come. Another person who used to come to the parties won't come because he has a picnic to attend that day instead of a funeral, and he wants his shoes. If this is the climax of the superficiality, it's the climax of the worthlessness and the meaninglessness of everything in this text. Um, the morning of the funeral, funeral, I went to see Mayor Wolfsheim. I couldn't reach him any other way. He pushed open a door. Um, that was marked the Swastika Holding Company. And when I shouted, hello, a lovely Jewess appeared in an interior door. Nobody's in, she said. Mr. Wolfsheim has gone to Chicago. Please say that Mr. Carraway wants to see him. I can't get him back from Chicago, can I? And then a voice called, Stella, leave your name on the desk. But I know he's there. Young men think you can force your way in here any time, she scolded. We're getting sick and tired of it. I mentioned Gatsby. Oh, well, what was your name? She vanished, and in a moment, he stood in the doorway holding his hands. My memory goes back to when I first met him, he said. A young major, out of the army. First time I saw him when he came into the pool room. He hadn't eaten anything for a couple of days. He ate more than four dollars worth of food in half an hour. Did you start him in business? Oh, start him? I made him. I raised him out of nothing, right out of the gutter. I saw right away he was a fine-appearing, gentlemanly young man, and when I told him he was from Oxford, when he told me he was in Oxford, I knew I could use him good. I got him to join up with the American Legion, and he used to stand high there. We were so thick like that in the evening. He held up two bulbous fingers. We were always together. I wondered if this partnership had included the World Series transaction, and now he's dead. You were his closest friend, so I know you'll want to come to his funeral. I'd like to come, but I can't. I can't get mixed up in it. There's nothing to get mixed up in. It's all over now. When a man gets killed, I never like to get mixed up in it anyway. I keep out. When I was a young man, it was different. If a friend of mine died, no matter how, I stuck by them till the end. You may think that's sentimental, but I mean it to the bitter end. I saw for some reason that he was determined not to come, so I stood up. Um... <clears throat> And then, after that, let's show our friendship for a man when he's alive, and not after he's dead. And after that, my own rule is to let everything alone. And we'll do a character study on Wolfsheim in a second, so not even Gatsby's closest friend is willing to attend. So, he found Mr. Gats, his pride in his son and in his son's possessions was increasing. Jimmy sent me this picture. Look, it was a photograph of the house. Look there. Jimmy sent it to me. I think it's a pretty picture. Very well. Had you seen him lately? Well, he came out to see me two years ago, and he bought me the house I live in now. Of course, we was broke, and we run out of the home, but I see now there was a reason for it. He knew he had a big future in front of him. Look here. This is a book he had when he was a boy. And then he showed me Gatsby's schedule, rise from bed, dumbbell exercise, study electricity, work. We're going to talk about what this means and his general resolves in a little bit. As the section closes. Nobody came. It wasn't any use. Um, <clears throat> he heard a car stop, and he looked around, and there was a man, the owl-eyed man with glasses. He um, had shown up to the funeral, and we'll talk about him and the rest in a little bit.